Some of you have met Dr. Scherzer before. For those of you who have not, uh, Dr. Scherzer was a particularly talented young player. In 1986, he uh, participated in the first U.S. Cadet Championship. That's a tournament with the top eight players under the age of 16 in the United States, and he won that tournament. Within a few years, he had won the U.S. Junior Invitational twice more, had won the uh, National High School K-12 Championship, and within a few years after that was an international master. Uh, another 18 months later, got the title of international grandmaster. He came in second in the country uh, in the U.S. Uh, championship, in the overall U.S. championship. We saw the game that cost him the U.S. championship when he was here last time. Uh, he also finished second in the world for under 18 when he was that age. If people have questions, this is a good time to ask them. Or Dr. Scherzer, perhaps you'd like just to introduce yourself in your own way. Yes, sure, thank you. Um, well, uh, <clears throat> As uh, Mr. Mailer introduced me already, uh, I won't uh, go into a lot of detail, but um, for those of you I haven't met, uh, I've, um, I guess I've been playing chess, uh, I played chess, I should say, uh, for, um, uh, well, a good uh, 20 plus years and uh, uh, got uh, many great opportunities. Uh, I met uh, several of the uh, current and former world champions, well, current at the time, I should say. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I like telling stories about uh, playing in the big chess tournaments and meeting, uh, meeting all those people. And uh, as you know, today we're, we're doing a rematch simul. Uh, I know there, there's a lot of talent around here. And uh, the last time I played it... Uh, <clears throat> It was kind of rough going, at least for me. I guess not, not so much for uh, the participants, but anyway, so you could see why I, uh, I'm eager to have a rematch. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, please, uh, please don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, this is a uh, opportunity just to chat and uh, uh, anything chess related is a good question. Uh, and uh, we could talk about uh, uh, a lot of the things I saw or a lot of the things you're doing. Uh, if you have any questions, if you're stuck on something in chess or you just want to make a comment, that's good. Uh, if you want to talk about how chess relates to other intellectual activities, I think that's also a great topic. Uh, so without further ado, uh, just please go ahead and uh, ask, ask away or raise your hand, <laughs> however that works. Well, these being teenagers, they're going to stay silent, aren't you? It's okay. Zach? I never liked asking questions. <laughs> Zach? Oh, I see a hand. Um, at what point did you start like investing time in studying end games? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, much later than I really should have. Uh, I think end games should be one of the very, very first things that you study. It's, it's a little counterintuitive when you first hear that advice because everybody wants to start in the opening. Right? Everybody wants to beat their opponent right away and, uh, or get a good opening. And, you know, when you study openings, you think, oh, I'm going to, you know, play this in my next game, which, which may be true. But if you really, really want to improve in chess, uh, you, you really need to understand in a, in a chess game where you're going. And so you... You do this counterintuitive principle of starting at the very end, and you'll notice the better you get at at the end games, you know, you start with king and queen and mating with the king and rook, and then king and pawns. You, you'll notice that the better you get at all that stuff, the the more you understand the game, the more you start thinking almost from move one about you know what the end game is going to look at look like, and um, you. Um, you know, you don't focus on trying to beat your opponent right away because that's pretty much never going to work against a serious player. 
Uh, so I, to answer your question, I started studying end games um, maybe uh, six uh, years into my uh, play, or six or seven years into playing chess. So I wish I'd started much, much earlier, obviously. Uh, I probably would have been a very different player, probably a better player. But um, so that's the answer. But stu study end games as soon as possible and as much as possible. Okay, thank you. You were on good terms with the Polgar family. Yes, still am. Do you have any any good stories about uh, the Polgars? Yes, uh, numerous ones. Um, well, uh, I would start by saying that uh, all all three of the uh, Polgars, uh, Susan, Sophia, Judith, they're all very different. Uh, Susan was, is the oldest, and she was kind of the pioneer, kind of the, the first uh, woman to come along and prove that uh, women can play chess as well as men can. So she, she refused to play in women's tournaments. Uh, she played in, oh, I, I say men's tournaments, but, you know, any, any gender could play. Um, and so she competed with the men. So the fact that she was sitting there doing that was a big, big thing at the time. Um, and then Sophia came along and she was, um, uh, she, she kind of had this uh, artistic talent, if I could put it that way. Uh, she, she liked to play like, you know, beautiful combinations and things. Um, and sure enough, she did. Uh, uh, one of her greatest achievements was uh, Rome 1989, uh, where she, she had a performance so good, it went into the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, and, then, and then Judith, um, <laughs> She was uh, very, very fierce. She was the youngest and uh, very creative, very determined, very talented, very tactical, and ultimately became the best woman player in the world. Um, so, uh, well, in terms of um, uh, good stories, I guess um, the first one that comes to mind was uh, where I um, I did not quite win the U.S championship in 1992 i had a uh critical game with uh john fedorovich and uh fedorovich always seemed to have my number but at at the end at the uh critical moment i had five minutes left on my clock and i had a beautiful brilliant winning move e3 which i did not see um in retrospect it was obvious if i set up the position and showed it to all of you a lot of you would probably say hey what about e3 uh, I was black, and so it was a e three was a you know very aggressive forcing attacking move, which won by force. Um, but it it ended with a very unusual mate, which I did not see. So not not only did I miss it, but um, Fedorovich missed it, and then we we didn't see it in the analysis afterwards either. So both of us were under the impression that White had played this um, good game and won from start to finish. Now, let me remind you, in, the, in that time, we did not have supercomputers. So we didn't have Stockfish or anything like that that could show people all the tactics that they were missing. Um, not that you guys would ever look at that. But uh, anyway, I... Uh, <clears throat> I said, none of us saw it. And then I spoke to Judith Polgar on the phone a few days later. And she's like, what about E3? And sure enough, uh, that was the winning move. That certainly would have uh, changed the course of chess history, at least for me and, and the players in the U.S. Championship. So as a result of missing that, I didn't win the tournament. Patrick Wolf won it. That was the 1992 U.S. Championship. But uh, anyway... The winning move that all the top U.S. grandmasters missed, uh, Judith found it, um, I guess, in a matter of seconds, uh, but then told me if, on the phone a few days later. Uh, there was no, <laughs> no real email at the time or anything like that. So, so that's my uh, one of my many stories about the pole guards. Jackson, did you have a question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask, what types of openings do you play? Like, do you prefer to move like the E pawn or the D pawn or a different pawn first or like something else? Well, I've always been an E4 player. And uh, 
to me, E4 just gave a lot more open positions, a lot more possibilities and tactics. When, when you play D4, it tends to be a slower moving positional game. Not always. Uh, I, I mean, these days people get creative on move four or five and you know, things get wild. But, but traditionally D4, you think, uh, you know, you could do things like play D4, Knight F3, C3, Bishop G5, you know, things like that with white where you just kind of uh, do a little setup and put your mind to sleep. But um, <laughs> I don't recommend that. Uh, anyway, the um, uh, E4 has always been my choice, but um, that's another thing. Looking back, I wish I had varied my opening some more. And uh, if I play, like, say, E4, D4, C4, and kind of rotate them, then you get experience playing every different opening, and you're also completely unpredictable to your opponents. But you might lose a, one or two more games in the process of doing that, but ultimately you'll be a, a better and less predictable player. After the US championship, if you uh, say came so close to winning, I seem to remember you spent some time in Budapest, uh, including having dinner with the Bulgars. Any stories there? <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes, I um, I did spend a lot of time with them. Uh, of course, world famous players, and I got the opportunity to meet another world famous player in the history of chess, Bobby Fischer. And uh, I'll just preface this by saying that uh, for those of you who know a little something about chess history, Bobby Fischer disappeared after he won the uh, world championship against Boris Spassky. And nobody knew where he was for about 20 years, from 1972 to 1992. Uh, so that was uh, that was the last millennium. I realized that, but uh, but Bobby was uh, a uh, kind of a you know an, an unknown, a recluse for for all those years, and nobody thought Bobby Fischer would play chess again. And people were wondering if they'd ever see Bobby Fischer again. You know. Hey, is he still a person? Is he he's still alive? He's still okay? And then sure enough, he resurfaced in 1992 and played uh, what he called the World Championship against Boris Spassky again and won. So it, it was a strange time. Uh, it, <clears throat> at the time, uh, Kasparov was the world champion uh, officially, but Bobby Fischer was calling himself the world champion. Uh, one of the things Fisher did was he he said that every world championship since his had been illegitimate. Uh, Fisher said that those games were all played by cheating. So um, I, anyway, so fast forward, yeah. So when I I was there having dinner with the Polgars, Bobby Fisher joined us. Sure enough, and that was uh, my my introduction to uh, to Fisher and. Uh, my impression of him was he was a very nice person. Uh, he was very polite. He was very friendly. He would never um, try to contradict you or say something uh, demeaning. As great as he was in chess, he was very relaxed when talking about chess. He'd say, ah, you know, maybe this move. He'd make little uh, quote-unquote suggestions. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so the, the dinner was quite interesting. Afterwards, we started analyzing some chess, and uh, and Fisher asked me to show him something interesting that I had played. And and uh, it was an unusual moment because uh, here I, I am uh, meeting arguably the greatest chess player of all time, and rather than showing me one of his great games, he's asking me to show him something. So the pressure was on. <laughs> I didn't know what to show him that could impress him or uh, something he, he wouldn't have already played or known. But I decided to show him one of my best opening uh, novelties. And uh, so we were talking earlier about studying endgames first, and that's right. But when you get really competitive, inevitably, you do start to study openings. And, uh, and people, even to this day, are very, very uh, protective of their opening secrets. Uh, when they have what's what's a they think is a, a killer novelty or something, they don't share that. I mean, they you you don't uh, 
you want to hold it and use it to win in a game uh, because in high level competitive chess any little advantage could can make the difference so long story short i um showed fisher one of my best novelties something i'd been working on for uh months if not years and i was very proud of i thought it was it was a great novelty and uh fisher just looked at it and refuted it uh pretty quickly he just said well what if i do this and just suggested some very simple moves or seemingly simple moves very typical of fisher uh you know all all fisher's moves look so simple like they're they're almost childish that's what the russians would say hey this guy plays like a child <laughs> um so fisher was always brilliant in his simplicity and sure enough that was the same impression i got when he refuted my my opening line i was it was they were very simple moves that i had not considered so that was my first experience having dinner with bobby fisher You were saying that you had a story? Yeah, okay. So uh, many years ago, I was playing in, in a round-robin tournament in Europe. It was one game a day. And uh, back in those days, we had what's called adjournments. Uh, you guys might not know what that is. But uh, uh, in the old time controls, it was like 40 moves in two hours with no increment, and then 20 moves per hour and so on. And um, they, uh, they often, um, the games went so long that, you would actually stop the game for a few hours. And the idea is you'd go uh, have dinner and then come back and play or maybe go rest and come back and play the next day. So anyway, you'd seal a move, which means if it was your move, you'd write down in a secret envelope what move you were going to play. And then you were, you were bound by that move. So these two really, really strong grandmasters were playing and one of them uh, sealed a move. And of course, the other person doesn't know what the move is, the move's secret. So try to imagine this, you're playing a game, the game stops, it's one person's move, he writes in a secret envelope what move he's gonna play, gives it to the tournament director, tournament director and then both, both people go on and uh, go, you know, have dinner, or rest, whatever. So anyway, one, the one grandmaster says, uh, oh, he, he realizes he sealed a completely losing move. And uh, he's just so down. He says, oh, well, this is no good. Um, the other grandmaster uh, realizes that he's in a completely lost position. Um, the guy could have sealed any of a number of moves and, you know, win. Anyway, um, so the, the grandmaster who sealed the losing move went back to the tournament director to resign. And the tournament director accepted it. Then the other grandmaster who realized he was in a losing position went back to the tournament director to resign. And the tournament director told him, you can't resign, your, your opponent has already resigned. So, <laughs> so it's just, just an example of where, uh, you know, Mr. Mailer's rule of not resigning might come in handy. Uh, so don't resign because <laughs> you know, it's an easy way to lose a game. Okay, right. it's the easiest way of all, you just quit. Yeah. yeah. We're not in favor of quitting. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are still here, have you thought of any other questions that you might have wanted to ask Dr. Scherzer? Uh, I have one. Go ahead. Here, go ahead. Um, so you sort of touched on it a little bit like earlier, but if you were like, like sort of able to go back in time, like for when you were a kid, what would you have studied first? Um, and sort of how do you have progressed to what you learned? Okay, well, if I could go back in time, uh, and that's, that's a question I have very often, by the way, uh, thinking about everything I could have done better and differently, but uh, it's hard to know at the time. But yeah, well, I would definitely study end games and analyze my own games. And I would only study openings to the extent that um, you could... Yeah, I would look at the high-level games and my own games and just games other people were playing and see what they were doing just to get ideas. Um, but I would not um, at all memorize opening. It's, it's just uh, really a waste of time. There's no opening that solves chess 
best. There's no opening that's always going to work. Uh, you know, no matter how much you like the opening and no how many tricks there are, once people start preparing for it, they're going to find some way out of that or they'll avoid it altogether. So it's, it's really just um, um, even the best openings, um, you know, chess is going to evolve and, and change and whatever you learn now won't be good a year from now. So, uh, but the end games, they, they stay with you forever. And um, the middle games, tactical ideas would be the next thing and positional ideas, those, those are all good. They stay with you forever too. So the concepts stay with you forever, but the openings, uh, that's that's what I would do differently. Do you sure, find that you. it's a real advantage that uh, your innate talent allowed you to find checkmates from the time that you were really quite tiny? Uh, I guess that's a talent. I, um, I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm blessed with that, but uh, yeah, I saw uh, some of that coming back a little bit today. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of the games, um, people let me get big attacks. So that that was always something to avoid uh, when playing me. <laughs> Although uh, several of you, including James, uh, had very, very creative defenses. And uh, and, and Zach also, I, I, a lot of times I thought it was game over and he kept making moves, so. Any other questions? Want to hear other cool stories about him? Sure. More cool stories. Okay. There are plenty to choose from, but... Uh... <laughs> Should it be a good story or a bad story? Well, you want to hear about, the, who wants to hear about the dark side of chess? Oh, these are all okay, such sweet sure. people. <laughs> we can learn about that. Uh, as it relates to me or other players? Let's go with other players. Okay, well, um, there, there are a lot of examples of uh, brilliant chess players who have very, very unbalanced lives. Um, I can name many off the top of my head, uh, but uh, there are a lot of a lot of people just did nothing but devote themselves to chess, uh, and <laughs> they they would play. And when I say nothing, I mean they often um, had no interest besides chess. Um, often didn't exercise. Often um, some of them couldn't drive a car, couldn't um, keep their um, financial things in order, pay their bills, couldn't keep their houses clean. Uh, you know, but a lot of these people did nothing but play chess. So I, I'd say that that's a dark side of chess is that if you just do only one thing, that's that's unhealthy and imbalanced. You should always you know, strive to have balance, multiple activities. And, and if you, um, uh, now if chess is one of the things you do, that's great. Uh, because I think that the things you learn from chess carry over to other things. Uh, but the, the ultimate example, in my opinion, of, of, an, um, of somebody who was not balanced well, but a brilliant chess player is Bobby Fischer. Uh, he was um, arguably the most you know, brilliant player of all time. Uh, but... Um, I started to talk a little about what it was like to, to um, be around him. And um, so, you know, he was very, very nice uh, and polite, but when you got him onto one of his topics, well, well, let me rephrase that. Uh, the, the conversation would inevitably go to one of about four topics that he would just obsess over. Uh, and one was... Um, the worldwide uh, Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. And uh, he would just say things to me like, oh, these thinking Jews, they're just trying to take over the world. Um, and that, those were his exact words. Uh, so, you know, he, and obviously it's, it's um, you know, extremely ignorant to um, stereotype one group of people, any group of people, but that's clearly what he did. 
And uh, he would just go on and on about how uh, the Jews are trying to, you know, uh, take over the world, control all its financial um, things. And um, you know, he'd go on and on about that. And then uh, another, another topic would be how uh, every single world championship game was fixed since his match with Spassky. So we're talking Karpov, Kasparov. Uh, after Kasparov, it gets a little fuzzy because the chess world broke up. But anyway, um, Anand, um, he wasn't in the um, same time period as Magnus Carlsen. But anyway, uh, all those people, he says, every single game was fixed. And he said every move of every game was fixed. So he actually, implying that he actually had looked at every single game, which might be, might be true, but came to the conclusion that every move of every game was fixed. So all those long hours that Karpov and Kasparov spent, um, you know, in front of the board and uh, getting low on time and thinking and making moves and struggling to beat each other, uh, those games were all fixed, according to Bobby Fischer. And he meant this. He, it wasn't a joke. He meant these things very seriously. And then he had sort of a paranoia about him where uh, he would, he thought everybody was out to get him, uh, the Russians, the Americans. With the Russians, it was always that, uh, you know, uh, as I said, Russian world champions, the games were fixed, but games had been fixed against him, he thinks. Uh, and he, he said he... The Rus Russia owed him a lot of money and royalties for his book, uh, uh, The 60 Memorable Games. So it was strange. It was, it was just one thing after another, uh, strange conversations. The circumstances of his complaining about the worldwide Jewish conspiracy, I thought that was a particularly interesting point because of the audience he had at the time. Right. Uh, well, he was in, in the Polgar's house, and of course the Polgar's are Jewish, and uh, he also met some very good friends of mine, the Kaplans, and they're Jewish, and I uh, are Jewish, so all the people he was talking to uh, were Jewish, so he, he would sit there in completely Jewish company and uh, say there's a worldwide Jewish conspiracy to take over the world, and you know, you immediately think, well, hey, uh, what about us? <laughs> and uh, and we never quite asked the question that way, but the implication was always that, well, you guys are exceptions. <laughs> he had unpleasant things to say about a number of different groups. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, she certainly wasn't limited to, to Jewish people. Did he offer upon and move to uh, Judy Polgar? Oh, no, he sure didn't, and uh, it wouldn't have worked out too well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, he, he um, avoided playing uh, too much. He played some offhand blitz games, I hear against Sofia Polgar, but that was Fisher random chess where he wanted all the pieces in the first rank to be rearranged before he started. So I don't know if that counts as chess. I guess. Um, <laughs> so he may have been biased, but he wasn't stupid. Is that what you're saying? He didn't, he, he knew what the result would be if he gave odds to the Polgars. Oh yeah, yeah. He uh, pawn, pawn and moved to Judith. He would he would not have been able to do, and uh, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. though I remember his saying that women were so vastly inferior that he would be able to give pawn and move odds to any woman and win. <laughs> well, that that may have been true at one time, but uh, as the Polgars proved, it's certainly not universally true. 